So um, just, uh, I think it will be today. I'm, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm releasing a report that I did for the IFRI, the French Institute for International Relations, which is uh, the, like the most important or one of the most important French think tanks. And uh, since two years, I was working on that, not all the time, but uh, working on that. Uh, and it is about uh, the circles uh, around Mr. Putin, um, because it's a difficult topic, of course. We have very little information, in fact. Uh, difficult, very important, of course, because uh, as we know, uh, in the authoritarian and the autocratic regimes, I mean, let's say authoritarian and dictatorship, uh, most of the time, uh, I think I, I, I quoted some researchers who did some statistics on that 70% of the time, this kind of regime is falling because of the internal fights of the elites. Um, we can make a definition, uh, we'll try to give a definition of elites then, but, uh, but indeed it is a very important to follow uh, this, uh, this question of the elites. Uh, in the meantime, and I will speak about that, it is a real question of, on Russia. And also I saw that it was um, important to, to write on that because for example, in France, and I'm sure it's, uh, it's everywhere in the West like this, people are speaking, still speaking about the oligarchs, but uh, do we have still oligarchs in Russia? This is of course a question. And I, I feel that uh, uh, with the Mr. Putin system, we don't have any more an, an oligarchy, but it is a question. And I, I will come back to, to that. So of course it was important and then, uh, then when the war started in Ukraine, uh, uh, the question with the elite was also, will the, the, the sanctions will work? It means, working means, will it push the uh, circles around Mr. Putin to, to forget about his war, to not to, to stop the war or, or to overthrow Mr. Putin and so on? Of course, it didn't happen, and I'm, my feeling, and this is what I write in this report, is that it won't happen uh, in the short term uh, because the sanctions are also working usually in the long, long term. Of course, um, for example, I was uh, looking at this book. Uh, I think it was published in '85 for the first time. The title is "Economic Sanctions Reconsider Reconsider Cider, Sorry, Economic Sanction Reconsider." Uh, from uh, Gary Clyde Hufbauer, Jeffrey Schott, Kimberly, uh, Anne Elliott Kimberley, and Barbara Wegg. And um, these people, for example, they studied uh, 200, more than 200 cases of sanctions in the 20th centuries. And they explained that uh, only one third of these sanctions reached their uh, goals, finally. Um, and usually it worked when the, the target and the aims were really uh, very well defined, uh, um, very small, for example, against one person or one small group of persons. And usually when the, the authority, the country, for example, which was um, uh, taking these sanctions were also quite small and uh, very, um, very, um, I would say, uh, uh, they didn't have uh, these, these sanctions, they didn't have some uh, uh, argue, argument between each other which is exactly the opposite of Europe, right? Um, even if at this moment, Europe is better. So whatever, in this context, it was important also to take a look at who are the circles around Mr. Putin. Um, um, on the methodology, I will not go too much into details, but what I did, of course, is reading everything I could read. And uh, we have quite, a, not, not, a, not that big literature, finally, not so much articles, books on the Russian elites. We have some, some are very good. Um, very precious work from the journalist investigation, from uh, from uh, from researchers, of course, um, and um, and uh, also I did a lot of interviews in Russia with um, politologists, but uh, more important to me with political consultants, um, which are for me very precious sources because these people are are working with politicians. And uh, in the meantime, uh, there are really people which are thinking usually. So it was interesting to work with them. And then also I try to, to use some ranking like um, the, the Davidoff one and the one of uh, Nezavisimaya Gazeta, a yearly one. Of course, it's not uh, scientific, uh, but it's quite interesting. It, at least it gives a list of uh, the most important people. So based on that, 
I, I use and I did as other researchers, I think of, uh, for example, Dimitri Gorenburg uh, wrote a very interesting article on, on that based on, for example, the Nezavisimaya Gazeta uh, ranking of the 100 most powerful people in Russia. Again, it's, it's not a list uh, that you can take it very seriously, but it helps. And indeed, you can recognize the names that we know and that are uh, important uh, to, to, to have in mind. So I did, a, for this uh, report, for the IFRI, I did a kind of um, combined uh, ranking of the 100 most important people in, um, in Russia, the most influential people in the Russian politics, where you can find all the usual suspects, I would say, politicians, uh, uh, businessmen, friends of Mr. Putin, uh, Chinovniki, and, and so on. And um, for example, in this 100, the list of these 100 people, just one uh, didn't, uh, I mean, left Russia. This is Chubais, uh, which was ranking like 79, I think, of my ranking. The ranking was made before the war. I took the, the 20, 2021st year uh, one. So based on that, I tried to do some, I mean, kind of statistics, let's say, uh, and try to, to understand what is the, 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 um, the list of these people and what are the groups uh, which are around Mr. Putin. Uh, I hope it will be useful for you, for most of you. I mean, many, you know, all of, of you, a lot of information. I think I managed to get some few little things which are raising questions. And uh, also based on the interviews I had with the, let's say the practitioners of the Russian politics, I could also stress on some, um, some parts of the, the, the I mean, some, um, some sides of the, how the Russian politics and the, the politics towards the elites is, is working. For example, um, I feel that the, the way that this group is working is really entrepreneurial. Uh, and I will explain this at some point. And at the end, I will try also to show where are the possible uh, 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 disagreement between uh, among these elites and eventually if we could imagine or think that at some point there will be some cracks uh, significant in this group. Um, when I try to describe this group of 100 persons, um, the first things I mention, I think, is uh, an, after, for example, the work of Dimitri Gorenburg, which was really, really useful and very good, good work, is um, to show that, um, first, this group has been uh, um, shaped for 22 years now by Mr. Putin. So this is his elite, I would say. And this is, uh, of course, something uh, that you know, but it is really important to keep it in mind because, uh, of course, uh, this is uh, um, um, explaining why this, this um, group and this regime is so resilient at, at, the, at the moment. So I feel it was very important to, to recall this, uh, this history, of course, what happened at the very beginning with the oligarchs at the time when Russian oligarchs were oligarchs, of course, uh, Berezovsky, Gusinsky, which were immediately after a few weeks of uh, Putin's power uh, already uh, challenged and uh, which had to, to leave their business and leave the country after, after a year or so. Uh, and of course, the Hodorkovsky case, which uh, is a kind of uh, um, base of, of the regime. Uh, but I will come back to that. Um, then you... We, we, we speak a lot, uh, all of us, specialists, journalists, uh, of uh, the, 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 this history, especially the Khodorkovsky case. But finally, they are very little, very little. And uh, contrary to what we can think sometimes, we, I think it's uh, important to keep in mind that this, um, this uh, fight against the, the oligarchs were very, I mean, very tiny on a few examples. And finally, most of the oligarchy remained in their position, kept their business. And um, for example, uh, in 2000, I mean, last year, uh, the number, the wealth number one or number, num number one at some point of the, the Forbes uh, ranking, for example, of the billionaires, the number one was Potanin. So directly someone coming, not from Putin circles, but coming from the Yeltsin, yet in time. And people like Abramovich, Deripaska are still remaining um, in, the, in, the, in the team, in the group of the, the people which are supporting the regime. Um, and probably they lost their status of oligarchs as such. 
Um, so the the first thing I wanted to to recall is that this this group is quite stable, um, and this is uh, Dimitri Gorenburg who is uh, trying to show that with the ranking of 2020. But we see that uh, most of the people uh, that we are seeing now in my ranking of the 100 persons which are the most influential in Russia um, um, uh, work quite early in the Putin's time, let's say, as president, uh, coming into the top 100 uh, uh, most influential people. And uh, for example, in the top 100 of 2005, from uh, I'm, I'm taking the ranking of Nezavisimaya Gazeta, uh, already 38 persons that are now uh, or last year in the top, uh, which are now in the top hundred, uh, were already somewhere in this in this ranking, and uh, in 2010, so 12 years ago, 58 of uh, these people were already in this ranking. So it shows that it is quite uh, quite stable. There was a big big shaking, of course, after Eltsin uh, um, second mandate. A uh, lot of people totally disappeared. And uh, this is also very important to keep in mind because it means um, that uh, when Mr. Putin will leave, uh, some might uh, fear that they will also disappear from this, uh, this ranking. And this is, of course, something that everybody in the Russian elite is thinking about. Um, I will not speak about that in this uh, today, but we can speak about that. But uh, we already see now the second generation coming to to, to power, let's say, the son of Kiryanka, who is now the head, for example, of uh, contact. And this is very important to be in charge of contact. Um, the, the son of uh, Fratkov, the sons of uh, Patrushev, one is a minister of agri agriculture. So no need to explain how important are this new, new generation, which will keep the business which were built by the fathers under Mr. Under Mr. Putin, so which is a, uh, probably the next report I want to write about. <laughs> um, so this stability of this group is, is really important. I think this is something we have to, to, to keep in mind. The second thing I want to underline, and uh, I will not um, teach you or give you new information, but it is, of course, the, 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 the spine uh, uh, of this group is are the Petersky, the people from, from St. Petersburg, so a lot are of course in these groups and they came to power with Mr. Putin. Um, um, I would speak about the Petersky and why the, we could put in the same group, the people, and usually they are Siloviki, which also were, let's say, raised as a young officers with Mr. Putin. Uh, so from in the KGB, um, it can be Mr. Narishkin, who apparently studied with Mr. Putin. It can be, which is now in charge of the SVR. Uh, it can be people that he met in St. Petersburg as uh, Bortnikov, Bastrykin, or Sergei Ivanov. It can be also people that he met before in Dresden. Uh, and we see that this in, in, um, in DDR, in, in um, East Germany, uh, when Mr. Putin was uh, working there. And it can be uh, like uh, people like Nikolai Tokarev, uh, who is in charge of Transneft. So, and uh, more important, even Sergei Chemezov. I will try to speak about that because Chemezov is really uh, an interesting and important uh, figure to, to, to speak about. So this Petersky, uh, I would say the old friends, the Petersky, the people he met in St. Petersburg, sometimes they can be friends, as you know, the friends of uh, the youth where he was practicing judo. Uh, uh, it can be the people with whom he worked when he was, uh, when Mr. Putin was working for the, uh, the mayor's office of St. Petersburg, and also the people from uh, the, the, the KGB um, are are a kind of spine of, of this group. And this is really important. A lot of them are uh, Siloviki coming from the, the law enforcement structures. And um, maybe they are not so important uh, uh, in the, um, they are not everyone. And I will come back to some statistics at some point, but, uh, but they have key positions. And um, if the Peterski are, are important, um, I counted that in my ranking of 100 persons, my combine of Davidov and Nezavisimaya Gazeta, Gazeta, 27 uh, on 100 are uh, the people that people the people that Mr. Putin was working with 
before he came to power in uh, 30, on the 31st of December 1999. So you, you know all of them, and the Medvedev, Kozak, Kudrin, Sechin, Kovalchuk, Timchenko, Rottenberg, and so on are, are these people. Um, so this is really important to keep this in mind. Um, uh, I'm coming back to the Siloviki. They are the heart of the system. If I take my 100 uh, names of my ranking, the combined one, let's say, uh, 40%, 14, uh, 14, one four, are uh, Siloviki. Uh, if you take into account the position that they that they are having at the moment, Bastrikin at the uh, um, investigation committee, uh, uh, Bortnikov, uh, the head of FSB and um, people like this. But if you take into account their background, um, so they are Siloviki, but not take, having a position of, of Silovic at the time. For example, uh, like Sechin, uh, who has obviously a Silovic uh, background, but is the head of Rosneft oil company, or um, for example, Alexander, very important man, Alexander Harishev, who is working with uh, Sergei Kiryenko at the administration of the president, um, Chemezov, uh, who is the head of Rostec, and uh, and this kind of people, you the number is not anymore 14, but it is 27. So 27 are or Silovic or having a position as a Silovic, like Medvedev, who is number two of the Security Council at the moment. So it gives an idea. It's not, uh, I mean, 27, so uh, 100 is quite important. And usually in this ranking, they are quite high. In the, they are more, more in the first half, let's say, than in the second half. So I think this is uh, interesting to get these figures in mind. Uh, third remark I want to do is that the former oligarchs, um, because I have a problem with this word oligarchs, as you understand, and I think all of us have, um, they are remaining in the game. I mean, again, we should not look only at Khodorkovsky and, and Berezovsky, but mostly um, all of them, Abramovich, Deripaska, Vexelberg, Friedman, uh, um, Potanin, of course, who is probably the most important and the most uh, powerful, very active uh, since the beginning of the war, playing a very I would say interesting game at the moment uh, is uh, are remaining in the game, and uh, I will come back to that. But it is really important to keep this in mind. There are some other businessmen which are I would not consider them as oligarch. They were never really oligarch, like uh, Vagit Alek Perov, who just uh, left his position as the head of um, of Lukoil, for example. Um, um, the very par the, the, the richest man at the time, according to Forbes uh, ranking, is um, Vladimir Lysin, that we don't know much about, which was not exactly an oligarch, even he was very rich. Um, and I would put uh, Vladimir Lysin with Alexei Mordashov, which are people working in the in the metallurgy uh, transportation a bit, are people which are not exactly they are not coming from Putin circle. They were not considered as really oligarchs at the time, or not so important at the time of, of Yeltsin, but they grew at the time of Putin. And uh, they are among the richest men at the moment. So they are part of the game. For example, we will see, but Mordashov is someone who is uh, helping a lot, Mr. Putin, for, I would say, private uh, things that investing in some companies which are strategic for his regime, for his personal regime, for example. And, um, and, and so on. And of course, you have new kind of oligarchs. Maybe for them, we could speak about oligarchs, which are the closest people to Mr. Putin, like Timchenko, Gennady Timchenko, the brothers Rottenberg, or Yuri Kovalchuk, which is considered at the moment as probably the, the most powerful man. I mean, after Putin and, and, uh, and uh, Nikolai Patrushev, probably uh, the, the, one of the most important person in Russia is Yuri Kovalchuk. Uh, we will see that his wealth is not that big, I would say, it's like three billion and, and something. So nothing to compare with Potanin or Lysin, which are their wealth is about 16, 20 billion, billion dollars. But uh, Kovalchuk is really important. And he is apparently, according to various sources, one of the few persons which have still have a an access direct to Mr. Putin. Very few. And you know, the, the access to Mr. Putin really reduced the last years um, after after the annexation of uh, of Crimea, this number of people really decreased a lot, decreased a lot. 
Uh, and um, for example, at the time, the head of the presidential um, apparat administration, which is really maybe the core of the power of Russia, or at least one of the very important centers of the power. At the time, it was the, the head was um, was Sergei Ivanov, and he didn't apparently he didn't participate to the decision of the annexation. So even Ivanov was was out of the game, but Kovalchuk was still in in the decision making apparently. So I will see if I have time to come back to Kovalchuk, but this is someone really um, important. Um, one thing also, when you look at this list, um, which is one thing which is really important is the, the group of the C, uh, Civiliki, not Siloviki, but Civiliki. I mean, the state servants, uh, politicians, state servants, chinovniki, uh, this kind of people. Um, in my uh, ranking of 100, uh, most important, most influential persons in Russia, 64 are coming from this group. And this is probably, um, it's difficult to speak about that, uh, but um, uh, they are the core of the regime. They are making it, uh, um, holding itself. Um, uh, this, these people can be politicians like Volodin, which is the speaker of Duma. It can be, uh, uh, at some point, it was Medvedev, I would say. Uh, it can be like people like Kozak, uh, Dimitri Kozak, who is uh, in uh, working at the administration of the president, he was recently in charge and is still officially in charge of Ukraine and the the so-called um, um, uh, People's Republics of Donetsk and so on. He was in charge of Abkhazia, Ossetia. So um, this kind of persons, uh, people in charge of the economy, um, people in charge of the medias, and so on. So this is a really an important group, and I will come back to that because uh, it is probably related to Russia. You know, the, the ranking of the Chinovniki and so on is something uh, uh, Im important, and um, but also to Mr. Putin's regime, which tries to to become more and more uh, probably under the surveillance of the Siloviki, but uh, more and more a technocratic state as well. And we see that people like this, this these technocrats. Uh, uh, um, coming to power, uh, Mishustin, the prime minister. Mishustin, the prime minister, is is probably a perfect example of this kind of uh, uh, civility. Uh, Andra, Anton Vaino, the head of the administration of the president, or for example, Alexander Novak, uh, who, who used to be the minister of energy, and now is the vice prime minister in charge of the energy complex, uh, but also in charge of the North Caucasus. Um, so this 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 group of people is is really important. Became also more important under Kirienka, uh, Sergei Kirienka, who is the head. I mean, is the vice uh, director, let's say, of the administration of the president in charge of the internal politics. Basically, his job or one of his job is to make Mr. Putin re-elected. So it is really a key position. Before it was Surkov who had this position. And Kiryenko uh, style, I would say, what he brought at this position, it was not, uh, it was it's different from uh, uh, Surkov, um, the managed democracy, you remember. Uh, it's different from the Volodin also. Uh, but Kiryenko is really bringing this idea of uh, have this uh, cadre uh, reserve uh, to promote uh, the competent people um in, in 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 the power in the regions and so on so this is what kirienko is is um, is bringing and um, because probably mr putin wants it um, um one point i want to to or one question i want to bring here and i don't have the solution and maybe in the discussion we can how can someone can bring something? Because I feel there is a kind of paradox that uh, was never solved. Um, if you read uh, the, 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 the excellent uh, Russian researchers we have speaking about the elites, for example, um, the sociologist uh, Ekaterina Schulman that I met, that I really respect, and it is always worthy to listen to her. Um, uh, for example, she can, in, in one article uh, she published for the Norwegian think tank, for example, she at some point she described the Russian power, Russian regime as a autocratic, authoritarian, and so on. So autocratic, one man is really uh, uh, running the country, uh, which was the question, this is, this is the point of the oligarchy. Maybe Russia is not anymore 
since 20 years, uh, an oligarchy, because uh, uh, no one but Mr. Putin has real power. At least this is the question. And Ekaterina Schilman would, would, would stress on that point and, uh, and, and really give definition as the perfect scientist that she is. And in the meantime, or a few pages later, stress on the importance in Russia of the role of uh, Siloviki, um, the, 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 the people which, are, which have a real power. And uh, finally, there is a question, is it really Mr. Putin, which is an, an autocrat? But um, um, can, we, can we say that all this, this big corpus of, of, uh, of Chinovniki uh, has no power? It, they have power. Um, can we say that finally, the power of Mr. Putin, which is showed, which is everyday stage on TV and so on, is an image of power. But, but, but the power of Mr. Putin is something which is much less important than he pretends. And finally, the power he has is the one which was given by the members of the, uh, of the oligarchy, let's say, uh, rich people, but also the Siloviki and so on. I think this is a real question. So is it really, it is an autocracy, but maybe it is an autocracy where the, com the power is coming from the other parts of, uh, uh, of the elites. Uh, you remember the joke uh, when Mr. Putin came to power when he was uh, saying that um, to, he was talking in front of uh, some assembly of uh, people from the KGB, FSB, FSB, and, and saying uh, that uh, finally our plan came to, to reality and now we are in charge of the country. It was a joke, but we don't know in which extent it was really, really a, a, a joke. And for me, this question of the collective Putin, is it a collective Putin finally or not is really a question. I quote in my, uh, my report, uh, the book of uh, Mikhail Zigar, the, the famous Russian journalist who, who, for example, at some point, um, I mean, I forgot exactly what, which page it is, but says that um, he reports uh, discussions that there were in 2004. So at the end of the first mandate of Mr. Putin, he says that Mr. Putin wanted to leave the power. And this is like representative of the elite who came. And this is interesting because the two men who came, which are the two most important, basically, I already spoke about them, were one Silovic, it was Patrushev, Dmitry Pat uh, Nikolai Patrushev, and one was a businessman, friend of Mr. Putin, Yuri Kovalchik. And both apparently, according to Zigar, came to him in 2004 and uh, asked Mr. Putin to remain in power because, uh, because these people became powerful thanks to Putin. Uh, and um, and because also, and this is my interpretation, probably also all these people and Mr. Putin first are afraid of a kind of comeback of uh, the Can you hear me? Oh, yes, yes, no. Okay, there was a little, there was a little cut, no? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay, I apologize. Um, um, yes, 2004, Mr. Putin says, and today it looks like absolutely impossible to, be, to, to, to believe it, but Mr. Putin wanted to leave the power in 2004. Two members of the elite came, and it is interesting to see that there was one Silovic, Nikolai Patrushev, and one uh, Silovic, <laughs> Uh, Sivilik, uh, Yuri Kovalchuk, and they came because the only person who, or regime which make, make them powerful was the Putin's regime. So they needed absolutely him to, to remain in power. My interpretation is also that maybe also it comes from uh, the fact that all this group is really afraid of the oligarchy. They saw what happened in the, in the, in the 90s. They, they hate uh, uh, Ukraine, which is maybe the the only real oligarchy in the whole post-Soviet uh, um, area. And, uh, and they think that it is weakening the, 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 the country. So um, uh, this is, uh, it, it can explain how we can articulate the idea of an autocracy and a collective Putin, because maybe the collective Putin had to, 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 to remain in power, to keep their power, and their wealth and so on, they have to have an autocrat for that. And of course, the question of the uh, 
uh, succession of Mr. Putin is a key issue and is a very difficult issue. And uh, the example of Kazakhstan in January showed them that uh, um, when you have such a autocratic, authoritarian and corrupted regime, the, the transition of power is extremely difficult. Um, so I just wanted to raise this question, which for me is, is not clear till the end, and uh, which is an important one. Uh, coming to the, the, the question of the resilience of the system, because we see from the beginning, and it should not be a surprise for anyone, but uh, okay, now after five months of sanctions, we just saw one of, one of the 100 more powerful people which left the country, and that's all. We saw some critics coming, or not really half critics, I would say. And, um, and by the way, they were not punished. So it, were not, it was not seen as, as a punishment, as a critics from the Kremlin, but some oligarchs like Friedman, um, um, Pasca, Potanin, Lysin, they say something that they gave some advice how it would, should be organized. Or Mr. Avec Perov as well from Lukol, they said that uh, peace is better than war, <laughs> by the way. So we understood that probably they were unhappy and all the sources we have uh, of people which don't want to, to speak, but uh, um, it's obviously that most of, uh, of this elite, at least, um, not most of the elite, but at least most of the elite, the economical elite, I would say, is against, even if they can be very close to Mr. Putin, like uh, uh, Co um, uh, uh, Kostin from VTB Bank, for example, apparently is, is really against, and they think that their business really will be very badly damaged. But, but despite uh, this, uh, uh, everyone remains uh, behind Mr. Putin, stand behind him, and, and works for, for the regime despite the war is, is something they didn't like. And one of the reasons I think is that the system, and I want really to insist on that, is, is inclusive. I said at the beginning that this system was, uh, is Mr. Putin's one. He's the one who shaped uh, this, uh, this regime, this elite around him. And uh, it goes, uh, by the way, further because even the regime was based on the rich. The, I mean, it's very funny to see in the West, in France, for example, some people are dreaming to have Mr. Putin in power because he would take care about the poor and the people. I mean, that's exactly the opposite. And all the system, once the, the examples were made to punish the oligarchs, Khodorkovsky, Gusinsky, Berezovsky, then all the system was designed for the, uh, the, the, the oligarchs or the very rich and uh, people. And uh, this is the flat tax, 13%, which is not good for the poor, uh, for the poor class of uh, Russia. This is the, the law on, uh, for example, the, the, the labor code, which is designed, uh, which is fantastic if you are uh, running big companies or small companies because you can fire people very liberal in this regard uh, and so on and so on. So the system is inclusive, is made for everyone to, be, to, to remain uh, part of it. Uh, maybe the temptation for Mr. Putin at the very beginning was to indeed uh, eradicate, push uh, totally aside the oligarchs, the former oligarchs, the one that he inherited from Elsin time to keep them in, in, in his group, in his regime. Um, but finally, he didn't do, maybe because he didn't want to uh, destabilize the, the Russian economy. But finally, uh, um, Finally, uh, he kept everyone. So, so the elite is very diverse in this regard. You have uh, uh, the group of the former oligarchs, Vexelberg, Deripaska, Potanin, and so on. You have the very friends of Mr. Putin, like uh, uh, Kovalchuk, uh, Rottenberg, uh, uh, and so on. I'm speaking about the economical part, but also it's, of course, Patrochev, uh, Narishkin, and all of these people. You have uh, uh, the very faithful people to Mr. Putin, which are now in charge of the big uh, governmental uh, um, companies. Chemezov with Rostec, um, Miller with Gazprom, uh, um, Sechin, of course, with Rosneft, um, German Greff of Sberbank. And you see, you can have people with really, uh, let's say, a Silovic mind, like uh, Sechin and German Greff, which is considered, and you can discuss, of course, what is a Russian liberal, but which is more liberal, at least a technocrat of the, of the, of the economy. So, these liberals, 
and uh, and uh, the the silovic and statist the people who think that the state should should play a big role are both inside the regime and they find their place and you can uh, notice that since uh, the beginning of the war mr putin protected uh, all the so-called liberals like Nabulina, the head of the uh, central bank of russia was even reappointed and i think putin did it really to show to everyone that she has to keep the position because she's the one who can manage efficiently the russian economy and the russian monetary uh, uh, policy uh, same with kudrin uh, very close to mr putin and it's funny if you read the telegram channels of the um, many russian nationalists and so on and statists like mr glaziev sergey glaziev and this kind of people they are asking every two days uh, nabulina kudrin to be fired they 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 they, 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 they speak about some rumors that uh, tomorrow they left the country and so on and so on but uh, mr putin is uh, from time to time showing that he has a meeting with mr kudrin he takes time with him he's listening him and respecting him. It doesn't mean that he's giving him a big position, but still he, he, he remains in the game. So this is really important to, and this is probably the key of the resilience of the system, that this system is inclusive. He's taking everyone, uh, even also, and I can continue the list. I spoke about the, the former oligarchs. I spoke about the friends of Mr. Putin who are uh, his um, teenagers, friends uh, like um, Timchenko and so on. The faithful people who are faithful to him since uh, uh, 30 years now, which are in charge of big uh, uh, companies. It can be also businessmen, which are not really politicized, I would say, like um, Leonid Michelson, the head of, um, of Novatech. Um, um, so uh, this kind of person, so Alec Perov, uh, till recently was still in, in charge of his company, Bogdanov from the Surgut Neftegas, very important Russian oil company. So this, everyone has its part of the system, the Chinovniki as well, the politicians, uh, the, uh, the, uh, um, the state servants and so on. So this, is, this is something uh, that we are really to, to keep in mind and uh, and it explains a lot in this uh, uh, resilience, of course. Uh, the resilience is also, of course, uh, made to make sure that all these people are, are also remaining in the system with a key role uh, played by the Siloviki. Uh, they have a big power. Um, but, um, for example, what uh, Ekaterina Schulman uh, underlines also is if everyone, everyone is remaining in the system is also that the system is made in a way that they have more advantage uh, to stay in the power than to go out of the power. Everybody is obviously thinking about that, because what is uh, striking when you observe daily the, the way that the Russian elite is working is that uh, is that um, 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 the power is always trying to satisfy this uh, this group, um, tr trying to to. For example, um, I studied uh, in two years ago the effect of the sanctions, the 2014 ones after Crimea, uh, that the the effect of these sanctions on the 12 uh, bosses from oil and gas sector in Russia. And I tried to analyze that. It was already a report for the IFRI, and. Um, and you could see that uh, the state did a lot, of course, to, to, to support them with a lot of uh, fiscal uh, uh, present, I would say, to these people to invest a lot uh, um, for them. Of course, it was a, a way to try to, to secure and to, to secure the future of the, the Russian oil and gas uh, uh, sector. But it's all, it was also a way to keep them, all of them, in, in the game in the regime, to support the regime, and so on. Uh, after speaking about the, this uh, inclusive uh, approach of Mr. Putin to, to, to create his system, I want to go to another step, which is also part of it, which is, which is really important. And uh, for me, it was less obvious that it was like this. I had to talk with, uh, with, um, with people who were working for quite high level in Russia and so on. And this is this uh, entrepreneurial uh, approach, I would say. Um, we, 
of course, we have the idea that Mr. Putin is doing some present to his best friends. Uh, you have this business, you do a lot of money and so on. And talking with uh, some political consultant, I saw that was not exactly like this. And it goes a bit against our understanding usual, usually, uh, which is the, this entrepreneurial uh, approach. One, one of uh, advise, one, an advisor of one of the main Russian politicians told me, for example, that uh, in fact, the way it works is that Mr. Putin would, uh, would judge everyone and his royalty to the regime if he tries to help the regime. So it's, it's a kind of, uh, sometimes it's a kind of hidden tax, I would say. Um, but um, the idea is that Mr. Putin would have, for example, some ideas. Now I want to develop, for example, some infrastructure, or um, then he would have an idea to, for example, focus uh, um, to get more investments in the new technologies because he thinks it is a, very important for the future of the states. And then everyone would know that and would come to, to Putin, to, to the Kremlin with some proposals. And basically it would, it would be a more, um, 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 he would judge, of course, there would be some friendship and the one who has access to, to Mr. Putin would have more chance to, to get uh, the business, I would say. But still, uh, you have to be quite good. You have to be innovative. You have to show that you bring something to, for, to support the regime, for, to maintain him, to make him growing, and, and so on. And um, when you have this in mind, and then you follow how it works, it is quite interesting to, to see that indeed it is probably how it works mostly. Uh, and of course, um, the, the, everyone wants to please to please the power and you never know where is the national interest and where is the regime interest. And it is impossible probably to, 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 to divide, to, to, to split. Um, just an example, uh, last year, no, it was on the spring 2020, so two years ago, sorry. Uh, Sechin, for example, who is a, a old man now, yeah, uh, suddenly decided uh, that he would invest between $500 million and $1 billion dollars um, in the genetics, in the research of genetics. Uh, I mean, this is absolutely not his sphere of, of, of influence and where he has to work for. Uh, but in the, he did it because, um, because um, and, and this is why you understand that Sechin understand the system, of course, from inside. Uh, in a way, um, um, he was uh, helping Mr. Putin to develop this key sector for the future of Russia in the Russia in Mr. Putin's mind, which is to develop the, the new technologies in the white sense, uh, what's meaning uh, all, all of them. So he was putting a lot of money in this, so contributing in Putin's eyes to uh, the future, the, the, the future power of, uh, of Russia. Um, the second thing which was important for Sechin, it is my guess, uh, and not only mine. Um, and this is, for example, the Tatiana Stanovaya, who, who wrote about that. It was, uh, it was a way for, for Sechin also to please uh, Mr. Sech, Mr. Putin's friends. Because Sechin, uh, who is seen as very powerful, and I will come back to that immediately, but uh, he's not that powerful. I mean, he's not as powerful as Kovalchuk, for example. So, and probably less powerful than Timchenko. And uh, because Mr. after all, Mr. Sechin was just a servant of Mr. Putin and uh, now he's in charge of uh, Rosneft, but you know, just one ukaz and he can lose his position. And you understand in his behavior, his political behavior, that he is feeling that he's quite weak sometimes. So um, the, to invest in these new technologies um, was also a way to please uh, people circle, especially Kovalchuk, because as we will see, I will, I will come back to that as well, but Kovalchuk is really, is, is helping the regime to invest in some niche. One is the medias, but one is also the new technologies. With the brother of Yuri Kovalchuk, which is Mikhail Kovalchuk, which is a uh, consider himself as a scientist, this is a question, but who is really uh, uh, trying to be very powerful in this regime. For example, he's controlling the very famous and important um, Korchatov uh, uh, Institute of Nuclear Research. So this is the main new technologies, nuclear and, nuclear and so on, that the Kovalchuk are trying to, 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 to control. And Sechin, by putting between half and half a billion and one billion dollars in the genetics is somehow pleasing and 
and doing something to make is uh, to to seal to uh, his, his relation with the Kobalchuk. And the third thing, it was also maybe a present to Mr. Putin because the the one of the two daughters on supposed daughters of Mr. Putin, Maria Vorontsova, is uh, also a member of the board of this new structure that Mr. Sechin created for that. And she's working in the science uh, and new technologies and medical research and so on. So it was also a way to please personally, I would say, Mr. Putin in his surrounding. So um, it, it shows how it works, this entrepreneurial logic. Uh, let, let's continue uh, just uh, I want to, yeah, let's continue with Sechin. Sechin also, if you look at what he does since, um, since um, especially since 2012, you know, before he was, so Sechin was always with, with Mr. Putin in St. Petersburg. I knew some people who, who met Mr. Putin at the time and they said that there was a young guy with very, uh, not very nice uh, suits at the door of Mr. Putin and it was Sechin at the time. So he's really someone faithful from the very beginning doing everything and he followed Putin all the time. And um, and when Putin left the, the Kremlin in between 2008 and 12, he put a lot of people around uh, Medvedev to be sure that uh, the regime was still under control. And, and Sechin at the time became a vice prime minister in charge of the uh, energy. And then in 2012, he became only member, uh, the, the chairman of the board of, uh, of Rosneft. But what he does, which looks like going against the national interest of Russia is amazing. It can be, for example, that to put in jail, first it could be to, to, to create like something like $6 billion of bonds um, for his company. And uh, at the point that the rubble was destabilized and it was said by Nablulina herself. So the national interest was just threatened because of his decision. Uh, same when, uh, for example, he decided for the sake of his country, or maybe just for revenge, to um, to take the control of Bashneft, which has a very efficient private companies, and for that he make uh, he put an oligarch uh, under house arrest. It was uh, Estuchenkov, uh, and um, and also he arrested or he made arrested. Uh, after a very rough uh, trap, I would say, uh, former minister and the. the at the time, he was Minister of Economy, Ulyukayev. So, you know, it gives extremely bad signals to the to 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 the investors, to the people who want to 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 work in the Russian economy. But he did it, and he was not punished for that. He was not punished for the bonds. He was not punished for uh, what he did with Bashneft and so on. And uh, we can can take a lot of uh, examples. And the reason is why and. That's my guess. I'm not absolutely sure about that, but uh, I think that what he does with Rosneft, which is a kind of Gazprom, but for oil, is so important for the regime. And also the money which is secured, which is made and that we don't have really a, at all a transparent view on it, not on Rosneft itself, which is quite clean and transparent company, but the one on, on it, uh, Rosneft Gas, I think. Um, is not clear and we don't know where this money is going. It is probably helping uh, the, re the regime and so on. So probably the fact that Mr. Putin in this entrepreneurial uh, approach is, is helping so much the regime with Rosneft, which is a really big uh, geopolitical political tool uh, makes that Mr. Putin can excuse a lot of mistakes that he does and the fact that the, so the company is badly uh, managed. And uh, uh, in this entrepreneurial logic also, I want to stress on a few examples like uh, uh, Chemezov, because if you are in the head of the military industrial, military industrial uh, industry uh, uh, sector, which is the case of Rostec, the company that Chemezov is, is running, um, uh, you understand that it is really important to, to of course, to be very good uh, with the IT. So Mr. Chemezov is also investing a lot in the IT and this is uh, uh, making him, uh, um, uh, um, this is his way that he's uh, um, um, helping the regime. I mean, uh, same with German Greff with Bear Bank. Uh, he turns this bank as a very old Soviet uh, managed bank into an extremely modern one, especially uh, in terms of IT with the clouds, with, the, with a lot of, 
innovative uh, uh, way of uh, uh, managing this bank and which is also helping helping the, the the country so you see all these people they have to come to to the kremlin and try to to help uh, at least in the big uh, direction that mr putin uh, decided uh, to 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 give to the to the power and of course it goes to his friends like mr rotenberg when he built the, the bridge on Crimea, of course, he probably earned a lot of money with that, but it was also his way to, to give some, uh, some help, some support to the regime. Same with, um, with Potanin on Deripaska, when, for example, they had to, to invest in something that they had no interest for, uh, which was the hotels and, uh, and, um, and resort for the Olympic Games in, uh, in, uh, in Sochi. And Abramovich was also solicited and so on. So this entrepreneurial uh, 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 approach is, is to me really important. You can go into details as well. Uh, someone would uh, do some investments which are not uh, economy, economically really relevant, but uh, they would do it. Uh, Deripaska did with some, uh, um, I mean, finally he didn't uh, go to the end, but for example, to invest in the Rogun uh, hydropower plant in Tajikistan. He had no interest, obviously, but he was asked to do that because there was some geopolitical interest. Same uh, with uh, people like, uh, I'm not sure about that, but Dmitry Rebolovlev, who is living in Monaco, you know, and was really around Mr. Trump uh, before his election and so on. And we have suspicion that he was one of the guys who maybe took the initiative in the entrepreneurial logic, but to, to try to, to give to, to the Kremlin some level of influence um, around Mr. Trump, who became um, president. Uh, same with uh, people like uh, Konstantin Malofeyev, you know, the orthodox oligarch, as we call him, who pro probably, again, by his initiative or maybe coordinated with some part of maybe the FSB or whatever, for example, put a lot of money at some point uh, to finance the militia in um, the separatist or so-called separatist republics of Donetsk and um, and uh, Lugansk in 2014. So um, again, I say it, it is probably his initiative because it's not sure that it is decided from the top and then executed by, for example, Malofeyev. It is possible that these people are coming where, with their proposals uh, and then um, the Kremlin would accept or not and then finance or not. Same with Prigozhin. Same with Prigozhin when he's uh, acting in, the, in Africa or in the Middle East. We, we can see sometimes that it is not coming from the top. Uh, I saw that when I followed him in uh, Libya, when he decided to support um, the son of Gaddafi, Saif al-Islam. Uh, it didn't look uh, as something which was uh, uh, obviously uh, um, decided by the Kremlin. By the way, it didn't lead anywhere. But uh, it seems that there, it was a way to, to, to make some proposals that could help the Kremlin at some point in his maneuvers in, in Libya. Uh, to, to finish my, I speak almost since an hour already. Uh, just to, to finish, I want to, to speak about the, the dissensions, the, the cracks inside these elites, which are not easy to, to, to see at the moment. And uh, I'm quite, I would say, pessimistic because I don't think uh, uh, what's going on at the top, at the moment uh, will go into um, some cracks important enough to make Mr. Putin decide or to be removed from the power or to decide that he wants to, he has to stop the war in Ukraine. Um, um, for this, I would insist on, on one thing. We know that these people are against the war, more, at least the, the, the one in charge of the economy, which are leading the banks, the companies, private or public, and so on. But in the meantime, they don't say anything against the, the, the war, and they don't do anything, uh, at least as, as we can see. I feel that, um, but still, we can still observe, and this is not only my opinion, I'm, in this case, I'm, I'm quoting, for example, Tatiana Stanovaya, but that um, the first, um, the probably the, the divide within the elite is probably not between the liberals and the Siloviki. This is often the way we portray it, but it is probably not true. And uh, we should always see that the liberals like uh, Greif, Kudrin, Nabulina are also absolutely part of the system. Uh, absolutely part of the system. Just remind how, for example, Kudrin played a key role uh, to overthrow uh, Mr. Khodorkovsky from his position into, back in 2000. Uh, three. So 
they are part of it, and this is probably not the best way to do it. Some, some say that at the moment, and it, it started probably before the war, that the, the cracks are between the Siloviki, which are extremely rich, but uh, compared to you and me, uh, but uh, extremely poor if you compare them with Deripaska or Kovalchuk or Lysin and, and so on. So um, we see that with the war, by the way, there is a party of the war and the party of the peace. I don't know if we can speak so, but at least there is a party of the war. And we see Volodin, Turchak, Medvedev, of course, uh, 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 Nikolai Patrushev, these kind of people all supporting the war and trying even to speak more uh, for the war, advocating for more war and having very tough speech and so on. Um, maybe because they are doing so because these people, they didn't reach, uh, they can't reach a better positions. They would never be oligarchs. So their interest is to defend another kind of, of regime, which is, which is a purely statist one, imperialistic and so on which is not obviously the way that uh, the people uh, um, dealing with billions are seeing, even maybe people like Sechin, who knows? We don't know what he's thinking about the war, by the way. We know that his company is really affected because of the, what's going on in, with the sanctions on oil. He understands that uh, within 10 years for him, it will be very difficult because his company would not have uh, invested enough to replace uh, the, um, the depletion of the, the production of oil. So um, after the sanction of 2014, it's a really an issue. So some say that the cracks are appearing at the moment uh, between, and I leave it as a question and it will be my final say word, uh, that uh, the, the, the real cracks are between the people, uh, the Siloviki and the people in charge of the economy. So not liberals versus Siloviki, but uh, head of companies, chief of companies, people in charge of the economy, and Chinovniki, especially Siloviki. And this is why, for example, Tatiana Stanovaya explains that someone as so close to the power, like, like Kovalchuk, um, he's the one who financed this new party, which is named Novel Day, new, uh, Novel Day, the new, new people, which entered in the parliament uh, last uh, uh, September, for example. And the idea is that maybe um, these people like Kovalchuk, who is the one who is able to, pro to bring a new party, of course, which is not against the regime, but which will advocate for more liberal or technocratic management of the economy, um, which is a different from the one, the, the way that the Siloviki are seeing the, the way that the economy should be managed. And this is for her, for example, a sign that people like as powerful as Kovalchuk and, and, uh, and, and Chemezov, for example, uh, can be against uh, some other part of the elite like Petrushev, uh, um, Belousov, uh, these people which are really uh, advocating for a more uh, state-managed uh, um, economy. And um, when you go into these details, it's quite interesting. I'm not sure it is leading to some uh, like corridors, uh, Kremlin's corridors revolution, but who knows, um, not in two years, but uh, within 10 years uh, with the new, the sons of all of this elite, which is coming to power. And these people are usually have a background of, I mean, the education in economy, finance, and so on. They will be probably seeing other way the, the, the way that the regime should be should be led and more paying attention to the to the economy. So I feel it is important to to keep this in mind, but.